That was okay. Um, so it is a pleasure to introduce our second speaker of the day, Professor Clarice Aiello, who will be telling us about uh, from nanotech to living sensors, unraveling the spin physics of biosensing at the nanoscale. So Clarice, take it away. I changed a little bit the title to be more ah, that's fine <laughs> and clearer, but I like to start by saying that I like to call myself a quantum engineer. This means that I build apparatuses to study and control things that are so small and so well protected from their environment, the better described by the laws of quantum mechanics, as opposed to the laws of classical mechanics that rule everything big around us. So people get quite astonished when I tell them that I study things that might be happening inside birds, inside butterflies. So before I explain where I'm going, I really need to tell you where I come from. We're going to start for a particular reason talking about hardcore quantum mechanics. And by the end of the, the, the talk, we have talked about things of biological relevance, such as organismal migration, how your cells react to oxidative stress, radiation. And I hope I will have convinced you that I think we can learn with nature on how to build better technologies. And that's because I'm a quantum engineer who's interested in how quantum physics informs biology at the nanoscale. So um, all my work revolves uh, around something that is commonly referred to as quantum sensing. And let's talk about sensing then. So uh, I think humankind is sort of obsessed with measuring things better because this might mean that we understand things better. So we can think about, for example, measuring better frequencies of or giving a better definition to the second. This is an atomic clock that sits at NIST and that helps us define very precisely intervals of time based on atomic transitions. We might think about measuring better magnetic fields so that the image of your baby is better resolved. And yes, that's the MRI image of a baby inside the mother's belly. Or we can think about measuring better accelerations, for example, so that your gaming experience is enhanced. Those tiny little accelerometers are now ubiquitous in all our handheld devices. But the question that I ask is, what happens if the quantity that you want to measure is very, very small? Or worse, what happens if the object that causes the quantity that you want to measure is very, very small? I'm going to argue that in this case, you need a tiny little sensor that can measure tiny little things. If the sensor is tiny, let's make it very tiny. Let's make it quantum. For reasons that I won't have time to explain, uh, you can actually mathematically prove that if you use a quantum object as a sensor, your measurement is improved. In other words, the sensor quantumness enhances the measurement. Uh, in my past, I've worked with a technological quantum sensor, and I'm going to present to you for the single reason that I'm going to compare it a little bit later on with sensors made by nature that are as good as this technological quantum sensor that I worked with in the past. So that's why I talk about things that are not biological per se. But uh, in the past, I worked with a single electronic spin in the material diamond that was a quantum enhanced magnetic sensor at room temperature. So that's the promise, right? Uh, for those of you who, who need a recap, uh, spin is a merely quantum mechanical uh, property that is as fundamental as mass and charge. And if you think about it, even charge, charge is a construct, right? Charge is um, a property that we use to describe how objects interact with electric fields. So for example, an, a quantum object can have a positive or objects can have positive or negative charges, right? The counterpart to show how objects interact with magnetic fields is a property called spin. In the same way that charge can be positive or negative, spins uh, are usually uh, represented by an arrow, up or down, and you should be seeing my, my little props here. I bring props to my talks. And um, the idea is that arrow up, spin up, or arrow down mean two different ways of this quantum object, for example, an electron interacting with magnetic fields. And this particular electron spin in diamond that I worked with, uh, it arose from a, a particular kind of crystalline defect. Uh, this crystalline defect in diamond belongs to a family of defect known as color centers. Color centers are called so because um, they absorb light and then they fluoresce they emit light and color centers are the crystalline defects responsible for the colors of those nice diamonds that you see there in the picture. The particular, wait, why can't I move? The particular defect that I worked with is a defect that is very common in the quantum community. It's called the nitrogen vacancy center. It arises naturally, but it can also be 
uh, engineered and it arises when a vacancy, a missing carbon atom sits nearby to a nitrogen, which is the most commonly occurring substitutional impurity in the diamond lattice. When those two things come together, there's a mess of electrons. Uh, there might be extra electrons coming in, unpaired electrons nearby, but something very magical happens as you calculate the quantum mechanical energy levels of this mess, of this localized electronic mess. The energy levels of this electronic mess really look like the effective energy levels of a single electronic spin. So when I refer to an electronic spin in diamond, you can uh, take it as the effective electronic spin arising from this localized electronic mass. And the way that we find and work with those um, things in the lab is we put a diamond's lab at room temperature on top of a moving stage and we move it around at the same time that we shine light onto it. In the lab, we shine laser because it's more convenient and more effective, but it doesn't need to be a laser. And the idea is that as we're scanning the diamond around, the moment that we hit one of those uh, effective electron spins, it's going to absorb light because it's a color center and emit fluorescence back. And this fluorescence we can collect. And this is how it looks like at increasing zooms. And to the very uh, bottom right there, you see what is quite impressively the fluorescence signature of a single electronic spin, what you wouldn't be able to get, for example, in usual uh, magnetic resonance methods. But actually this spin, uh, and that's the key reason why I bring it up, uh, has an even nicer property, uh, which is called in the jargon, a quantum state dependent fluorescence intensity. For reasons that I won't be able to, to, to explain, it turns out that this defect in diamond that we can image emits a different mean intensity of fluorescence if the spin is up or down. This means that just by looking at the fluorescence intensity, you can actually infer the quantum state of the spin. And that's extremely convenient too. But we can put to use as a very sensitive magnetometer and the idea is as follows. Zero and one, I just mean the two different states of the spin you can think of it as up and down. And it turns out that the state, uh, the, the two energy states are in the microwave, like in the difference on, on their energy states, about gigahertz. It turns out that the state zero is insensitive to the presence of magnetic fields. If we put the diamond in a magnetic field, state zero won't care. Whereas state one will care in the sense that it is sensitive to magnetic fields and it will shift in energy as a function of the magnetic field by a tiny quantity that I call delta here. And it turns out, if you remember, uh, if you've ever taken quantum mechanics, um, your um, energy shift delta is proportional to the magnitude of the seen magnetic field via something called the Zeeman interaction. And what I'm going to, to the point that I'm going to make here actually underlies 95% of the modalities of known, of known as quantum sensing. It's actually very important. The problem of measuring a magnetic field by a quantum object is actually measured onto the problem of the experimentalist being able to measure a detuning, a shift delta from a known resonance in the absence of the quantity that you want to measure. Again, this is true for magnetic fields, but that's the way that people use quantum objects to measure other things also, such as temperature and electric fields. There's always an energy resonance that shifts uh, with the thing that you want to measure in a way that you know. And the experimentalist knows how to measure this detuning from the expected energy difference. And that's actually a signal processing problem that electrical engineers and physicists have known how to deal with for many, many decades. So this is basically how all quantum sensing works. And this is how this defect in diamond that has nothing to do with biology can be put to use as a very quant sensitive um, uh, uh, quantum sensor. For reasons that I still won't have time to explain, this is only true, like you can only obtain enhanced quantum information while the spin is well described by the laws of quantum mechanics. Everything that starts quantum dies classical. This is the reason why we live in a classical world. As quantum objects start interacting with each other, they die down as classical objects. So the effective time during which we can use this sensor as a quantum enhanced sensor is about two microseconds at room temperature and in the bulk of the diamond lattice. It's a quantum sensor for about two microseconds. And actually, this is incredibly long for something to live as a quantum object at room temperature. And um, again, 
the idea then for, I mean, it's to have a tiny little sensor that we can bring in very close proximity to a tiny little sample. And because we know how the sensor reacts to tiny magnetic fields produced by the sample, we can measure those tiny magnetic fields with a very good, uh, with a very good spatial uh, resolution, if you will. Okay, so this uh, was just to show you a instance of a quantum sensor that works at room temperature and in messy conditions, in the messy conditions of the diamond lattice, in the messy conditions of the sample that it's trying to measure, right? And uh, I want to spend the next two minutes quenching a question that I always get in the second part of my talk. So the question is the following. Well, I mean, you just told us that the energy difference between the sensor, right, between the zero and one states is about three gigahertz. If you calculate KBT, thermal energies, at room temperature in gigahertz, it's about 6,000 gigahertz. So are you telling me that this stuff that has a three gigahertz energy difference and is immersed in a 6,000 uh, gigahertz thermal energy bed, are you saying that this, this stuff is quantum? Isn't this going to, to thermalize? How is that even possible? And the, the, the answer is yes, it will thermalize given the, 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 the the, the environment, right? But before thermalization, for those about two microseconds, while the sensor is still able to be well described by the laws of quantum mechanics, you can still get quantum enhanced information out of it. So the fact that the energy difference of the sensor is way smaller than thermal energies is not a problem because all the advantage that you get from the sensor is obtained before thermalization times. So now I'm going to shift gears Totally, there's a reason why I need to spend 10 minutes talking about this technological quantum sensor. So up to, to, to like five years ago in my life, those were the type of sensors that I was used to dealing with, right? Big machines, humankind made sensors. But at some point I realized that nature made sensors many, many times outperform humankind made sensors in crazy, crazy ways. I would like to talk to you about a magnetic sensor that I'm going to argue acts very similarly to the spin sensor in diamond that I just described, okay? It's also a room temperature technological, uh, uh, natural quantum sensor. So this is really what I want to talk to you about, about potential living quantum sensors. But um, if we want to talk about biology at the nanoscale, let's talk about biology at the nanoscale, namely the chemistry. Actually, um, it's been known for many, many decades in a field called radical chemistry that there are chemical reactions that depend on spins and as such depend on magnetic fields. So again, for test tube chemistry, there is no doubt that this is what is happening. The idea is that this is how this happens. There's a chemical reaction happening. And at some point, the chemical reaction comes to a crossroads and it effectively looks for a electronic spin state of a certain electron. If the chemical reaction measures the certain, the special spin state to be up, the chemical reaction continues to run branch. If the chemical reaction measures the spin state to be, be down, the chemical reaction continues through another branch. Importantly, the macroscopic final products of those two branches are different, okay? So spin states, very finicky quantum states might actually be having macroscopic influences on the final outcomes, on the macroscopic outcomes of chemical reactions. If at the point that the chemical reaction comes to this crossroads, this electronic spins interacts with a magnetic field briefly, okay? And for reasons that I won't have time to explain, this interaction with the magnetic field uses the same quantum mechanical laws that the spinning diamond uses. It's really a quantum sensing phenomenon. It interacts with the magnetic field and as such, the magnetic field might actually influence the probability that the spins are found up or if the fin spins are, find, uh, are found down. This means that a, magnet, a brief interaction with the magnetic field, a quantum sensing of a magnetic field might actually influence the chemical reaction macroscopically. This again has been oui, demo, oui, demonstrated at room temperature in solution in the gas phase, in the solid phase, and for magnetic fields as tiny as the magnetic field of the earth, which is 
orders of magnitude weaker than the magnetic field that you sense when you put your cell phone close to your face. Um, this whole story is brought to biology by birds. Again, I really don't care about birds, but they, they were very instrumental in bringing this uh, conversation to uh, biology and to biological physics. It's known that birds, when they migrate north and south, they do so using the magnetic field of the Earth, at least as a partial cue. And nobody knew how they were doing this. And uh, in the end of the 70s, uh, a theoretical biophysicist made the outrageous hypothesis that was as follows. Were the same type of spin-dependent chemical reactions happening under physiological conditions inside a bird, birds and organisms in general could sense or could interact with magnetic fields to the extent that they could sense the different physiological concentrations of products coming from those two different branches of the chemical reaction. There would be something inside the bird that would actually made it distinguish between magnetic field lines. For example, maybe the two branches gave rise to different photobiomodulations of some pigment in the retina so that the birds would see brighter or darker depending on where it looked, depending on the interaction with the magnetic field. While this has never been proven in birds for reasons that, that I'll, I'll, I'll continue to describe, right? Uh, the biophysicists started looking for proteins, animal proteins that could sustain such spin-dependent chemical reaction. And at that time, the only animal, because birds, spin uh, the protein that could sustain such spin-dependent chemical reactions uh, were a class of pigments, photoreceptors, called cryptochromes. Now, cryptochromes are flavoproteins. They have a flavin, a chromophore, and they're present in birds' retinas, in the um, antennas of migrating butterflies, but also important, it's present in all our human cells, because it also has circadian rhythm regulation functions. And it turns out that cryptochrome is really widespread throughout the tree of life. All those organisms there uh, have uh, express cryptochrome from very simple to very complex. And there's a lot of macroscopic evidence that somehow relates the presence of cryptochrome to magnetosensing. And for those organisms that such evidence is available, they're boxed in red. Okay. And it's really like evidence for cryptochrome-based magnetosensing is really widespread, but unfortunately at disconnected lens scales. So at the very tiny lens scales, like the test tube chemistry lens scales, there is no whatsoever doubt that cryptochromes are interacting with magnetic fields in the same way that the spinning diamond is. Okay. For example, and that's the top left plot. Some researchers put cryptochrome in solution and they tracked the fluorescence of cryptochrome as a function of the time during which we shone a laser onto the solution of cryptochromes. So cryptochromes have a flavin chromophore that is if you shine laser they absorb light, get excited and then they emit fluorescence back. So the first thing that you see is that this fluorescence is decaying, the chromophores are being bleached by this strong laser. But as the researchers also, as they were collecting this fluorescence, post a tiny magnetic field on and off, what, and what, you, what, what they saw, and that's what you see in the little inset there, and this is not an error, this has been repeated with many different magnetic fields, is that the mean fluorescence intensity was also modulated following the, the rising and lowering of this magnetic field. Now, again, this is in one-to-one -one correspondence with what I described for the spin in diamond. Just by looking at how strongly the diamond was emitting light, I could read if the spin was up or down. Here, for the cryptochrome in solution, it's the same thing. Just by looking at how strongly the proteins in solution are emitting light, you can actually measure if the spin was up or down, and hence if the chemical reaction continued through one branch or the other branch. I won't have time to explain, but uh, there, there are incomplete but good enough measurements that show that cryptochromes in solution at room temperature might be retaining their quantum character for as long as one microsecond. Again, which is on par with the two microseconds that I quoted for the spin in diamond. Okay, so at the tiny chemical length scales for test tube chemistry, those things are bona fide quantum sensors inside proteins. Except that like the next level of evidence comes for 
big organisms. It's like birds put in cage during migration season, and then you mess up with the magnetic field and the birds want to migrate to different directions. Flies, I have no idea how that's done, but flies can be trained to sense food via the presence of a magnetic field. Researchers train the flies to do this, and then uh, they, they knock out they remove the cryptochrome gene, and then the flies are no longer able to find food based on the presence of a magnetic field. Then in the further experiment, the researchers put back human cryptochrome inside the flies, and the flies are back to finding food given the presence of a magnetic field. Most of this evidence is consistent with a spin phenomena being active under the hood, but there is nothing like no unambiguous evidence from test tube chemistry to like plates of cells or flies or birds. So here's where we enter. We are starting in my group to bridge those land scales. We want to, and that's that's not my microscope, but uh, th that's the microscope that I built while a postdoc. We are building glorified microscopes with coils, okay? And we want in the same experiment to actually measure the quantum mechanical degrees of freedom of the spins via intensity of fluorescence. This is called optically detected magnetic resonance. We want to initialize, manipulate, and read out the spin degrees of freedom inside those proteins, say inside a cell. Okay, look at this using, those are really bona fide quantum tools. It's a quantum sensing experiment. And at the same time, look downstream via regular fluorescence microscopy. What are the consequences of a different spin preparation on cellular processes. Okay, so um, this uh, is part of a field called quantum biology, and I really say that the bottleneck is the lack of high-tech instrumentation that can actually measure and coherently quantum manipulate spins in vivo with single molecule and single cell resolutions. When I say I'm building a magnet, uh, um, sorry, a microscope with coils, it's not going to look like the thing to the left. It's going to look like the picture to the right. It's a big optical table. Again, it's not ours. Those two are, are, are from uh, pictures from the internet. We're building big optical tables uh, with electronics around. It's really like a quantum experiment within a biological matter. For a physicist, I would describe this as light matter interactions where matter is biomatter. Again, uh, we can model uh, the spin physics, for example, inside cryptochrome uh, using um, quantum mechanical tools, right? The tools of open quantum systems. And actually, we can start making uh, predictions. And uh, I would like to, 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 to show you like one prediction. Please look at the top right plot where uh, this is a prediction. I'm dying to take this, this curve experimentally. Uh, in the y-axis, you see the magnetosensitivity, that is how sensitive those cryptochrome proteins are as a function of magnetic field strength for molecules stumbling in solution. The first thing that you see is that this curve is uh, not monotonic with magnetic field strength. It goes up and down at about 10 times the magnetic, five minutes, right? Yeah, uh, five, three, five, approximately yeah. just a general kind of, you yeah. know, we're approaching the top of the hour. So um, for uh, ten, uh, about 10 times the magnetic field of the Earth, uh, this magnetosensitivity is almost, it is very quenched already. And actually this is understood in the spin physics, spin dependent chemical reactions depend on magnetic fields that are weak. This means that if you put your magnetosensitive proteins inside a, an MRI 5 Tesla magnet, small changes in that big field are not going to affect the chemical reaction pass. So what we really should be caring about are magnetic field strengths on the order of the Earth, on the order uh, of this, your cell phones, right? So it goes up and down. And very interestingly, this curve sort of peaks, this magnetosensitivity curve sort of peaks very close to the magnetic field of the Earth, which the birds are putatively using to navigate. It's either a coincidence or it shows that there has been some uh, uh, evolutionary pressure. We are instrument builders, we cannot tell those things apart, but we think that people who can do directed evolution of proteins can help us uh, tell those two hypotheses apart. Is it a coincidence or can there have been some evolutionary pressure? I will spend the last two minutes of my talk pushing birds out of the equation. Birds were instrumental to bring this to the, to the conversation, but it's super important to realize that there is, again, low tech, high, large scale, uh, evidence that many physiological processes might be 
interacting with magnetic fields in the very same way that I just described, from things such as the regulation of reactive oxygen species production, uh, glycolysis rates, refrigeration rates in cells, uh, stem cell growth in planaria, how much uh, cellular uh, uh, bacteria DNA gets repaired by enzymes, um, the regulation of cellular autofluorescence by mitochondria, mitochondrial flavoproteins. And I usually, the, the thing that usually makes people uh, agree with me that this is important is this figure that I plot there. It's taken by a group in Munich of a precision measurement quantum physicist. His name is Peter Fillinger. And what he does for, and I have, I have permission to show this image. What he does for a living is he builds very good Faraday cages, very good hypomagnetic chambers, okay? And then he shoves ultra cold atoms experiments inside to do precision measurement, doesn't matter. He started to hear about magnetic field effects in biology and he was like, can we grow things inside those hypomagnetic chambers to see if there's any effect of the tiny magnetic field onto cells? And what he sees is crazy. He grows tadpoles for, and again, this is controlled, okay? So he grows um, tadpoles for two days because that's as long as he can go without asking for a bio license in this hypomagnetic chamber. Again, magnetic field of the earth is about 50 microtesla. He, inside his chambers, we have a noise level of about one nanotesla. And what he sees macroscopically is that about 30% of the tadpoles are malformed, macroscopically malformed. Again, let, let's think of, of what's going on here. We're not putting a magnetic field, we're just taking out a tiny DC magnetic field and you see big changes, right? If there were any calcite or, or any magnetite, uh, any real magnet inside the cells, those would need to be huge to react to this very tiny magnetic field that is taken out. And again, this is crazy, right? And also people have seen that if they grow cells um, under hypomagnetic field conditions, not as good as his, but there are epigenetic changes, methylation changes, gene expression changes. It opens this whole new Pandora box, like from like, what's the magnetic field on Mars? Can we colonize Mars, right? Can we grow lettuce in Mars too? Can we deterministically learn how to tweak those endogenous quantum mechanical degrees of freedom in biology towards Theranostics. Another very cool piece of evidence, low tech, is that uh, people have seen that if you apply weak magnetic fields to a plate of cells, you can actually change calcium signaling. If this is truly mediated by a spin mechanism, well, maybe you could start doing some sort of thing that replaces optogenetics. Optogenetics, you need to genetically encode something so that you shine a laser and then you open and close ion channels. Imagine that you could learn deterministically how to influence each one of your ion channels opening and closing with weak magnetic fields and without the need for freaking genetic manipulation. So this might be extremely important and I'm arguing that the code book to get there is like to get to an app in your cell phone where you apply, uh, you, you push a button and say, I need help with wound healing. And then your cell phone uh, produces a magnetic field of the particular frequency and intensity to help with that particular chemical reaction, right? In order to get there, you need decades of high tech quantum inspired instrumentation to get the quantum code book on how to deterministically alter quantum degrees of freedom in biology. So it's throwing quantum tech at those systems. So um, I'm going to, to finish here. Uh, and I would like to thank my group members who are visionaries to, 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 to join us in this crazy adventure, right? To really bring quantum tech to uh, endogenous quantum mechanical degrees of freedom in biology. So thank you, and I'm ready to take your questions. Let's thank the speaker for a really fascinating talk. Um, thank you so much. So I think there was one question in the chat. So I think we should, let's do that one, and then we'll stop recording and continue the discussion more informally uh, for as long as, as people can stay. So uh, the question was, was from Yulia Pushkar. Feel free to unmute uh, if you like, or I can read it. Um, yeah, maybe I can um, I can please. speak if you can hear sure. me. I think there was an old joke that someone put a hen in between.
between magnetic uh, poles and hand was scre like not screaming, making a noise. And then it's turned out that the magnet was a kind of squish in his head. So I think overall, there is some skepticism in the field of, you know, magnetic effects in biology. And my question is a kind of along this skepticism because it's been a lot of discussion of those crypto chromes uh, mm -hmm. on navigation, but there could be very simple checks, for example, just knock out the protein and maybe, you know, knock out something in the bird sounds kind of difficult, but if there are like smaller organisms, you mentioned fruit flies can be trained to send magnetic field, et cetera. So just if you suspect something, just knock it out and show that they will be like, you know, magnetic field insensitive phenotype. Has it ever been done? So again, it's been done in, in, in flies. Um, I know that someone produced, I, I mean, mice don't migrate. Someone produced for other reasons, cryptochrome free mice. All I know is that the mice weren't happy. So I'm not sure to which extent that that's a good thing to, to, to do because cryptochrome might be altering other things. But I really want to make sure, I, I, I mentioned this many, many times, low tech evidence for weak magnetic fields altering physiology has been around for decades. Especially the quantum community, and, and, and I understand why, don't take this evidence as good because it's low tech, it's correlational. And what I propose is exactly breaking out of this cycle of low tech evidence, right? And I think that the only way to do this is by actually bringing quantum techniques to study biology, to study quantum mechanical degrees of freedom in biology as if they were, because they are quantum sensors or qubits, if you will, right? There are a lot of like evidence that weak magnetic fields might be doing things that are not well understood uh, just by magnetite models of like magnetites, uh, crystals being moving inside cells. Th this is true, for example, for um, uh, magnetotactic bacteria that have like a, a row of, of uh, big chunks of magnetite crystal and they, they move, they align with the magnetic field of the earth because of those crystals, but there's no evidence that such big magnetite crystals are present in complex species that migrate, for example, um, uh, birds, um, butterflies, and, um, uh, and turtles, for example. Birds, butterflies, and turtles. Uh, again, this is not only, and, and I'm sorry if you can hear the, there, there's work being done outside, I'm sorry. Um, this is not about birds. This is not about migration. This is way more widespread than that. There's tons of proteins usually found in redox reactions that are magnetic field sensitive, okay? That can sustain such spin dependent chemical reactions. Those are really nice knobs that are there for us to, to, to learn how to, uh, how, how to tweak. It's really like bioelectromagnetics in biology. It's learning how to, how to interact biomatter with electromagnetic fields in a way that I, I, I think that maybe in 30 years we can get something like we can get a, a Star Trek tricorder out of it. Yeah. yeah. So I think let's, let's officially move to the more informal discussion. So I'm going to stop recording.